Thank you for downloading this episode of In Our Time. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk slash radio4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. In his History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Edward Gibbon wrote, Modern Europe has produced several illustrious women who have sustained with glory the weight of empire, but Zenobia is perhaps the only female whose superior genius broke through the servile indolence imposed on her sex by the climate and manners of Asia. She equalled in beauty her ancestor Cleopatra and far suppressed that far surpassed that princess in chastity and valour. Zenobia was a warrior queen who ruled the ancient city of Palmyra in Syria. In the 3rd century AD, she led a rebellion against the Roman Empire, conquered Egypt and briefly ruled a substantial empire of her own. Her reign lasted only a few years before her defeat and capture by the Emperor Aurelian, but she left a lasting impression on historians and later writers. The ruins of her capital, Palmyra, survive today in a region of Syria ravaged by today's civil wars. With me to discuss Queen Zenobia are Edith Hall, Professor of Classics at King's College London, Kate Cooper, Professor of Ancient History at the University of Manchester, and Richard Stoneman, Honorary Visiting Professor in the Department of Classics and Ancient History at the University of Exeter. Edith Hall, can you give us a quick summary of Zenobia, who she was, Zenob- where she was? Yes, Zenobia is um, uh, an uh, Arabic uh, noblewoman. She's the daughter of the governor of Syria. She marries the governor of Syria. She's born in about 240 AD, and she um, has one small child um, and a, a little boy after she marries and she although an Aramaic speaker is extremely Greek in culture because this is the era of the great um, Hellenizing of, of the East um, and she's also very at home in, in um, the Roman imperial administration she's, she's very culturally sophisticated she's a terrific horsewoman, a brilliant military commander and very very brave where does all that come from? We basically have two important sources for Zenobia. Uh, she's in the middle of the 3rd century AD. That's about 300 years after Cleopatra. We've got a Latin author um, who wrote a thing called Historia Augusta in the 4th century, the end of the 4th century AD. And we've got a 5th century Byzantine Greek Christian source called Zosimus. They sometimes agree, they sometimes don't. Um, we also have various bits and pieces in connection with pe- other people in, in, in her court, including the famous Bishop Paul of um, Samosata, who's a very important early Christian. So she comes in tangentially. We have inscriptions, we have archaeology, we have coins. Because you did say a lot about her bravery, intellectuality, and so we'll come to that later still. Again, we, we, she's inside... Well, the, the, Pamara is inside the Roman Empire. Can you give listeners some idea uh, what it what it had achieved by that time. In the middle of the 3rd century, it's, it's, it's probably at its maximum size and effectiveness, isn't it? Palmyra has been very much on the ascendant for the last 150 years before this. The Roman Empire itself has shrunk. It was at its biggest in, in the early 2nd century AD under Trajan when it went all the way to the Persian Gulf and it went all the way to the Caspian Sea. That eastern frontier has moved rather westward, which has meant that countries like Syria who are the sort of uh, buffer states between the Roman Empire and the Persians and the Parthians, have become more and more important and have been able to exploit the buffer state status. So it's become a Roman garrison, then it became a Roman colonial, which is very important because it could collect its own taxes. It's been seen more and more as an, an equal partner of Rome, and it's got a huge amount of revenue from levying a 25% tax on every single item that the caravans of camels going from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates across the desert had to stop there and the Palmyrenes actually levied their own taxes once they'd become a a colonial under Caracalla which is in the earlier third century and were unbelievably rich and really wanted to display it. Kate Cooper what uh, challenges to the still saying on the Roman Empire what challenges to its authority was it facing in the middle of the third century AD? Well, the third century is, I mean, either a terrifying or a really exciting period for Rome, depending on, you know, how you want to look at it. It's a period where they're they're looking at the destabilization and eventually decline of their major enemy on the eastern frontier, the Parthians. And then at the same time, they've got coming from the north across the Danube, ultimately coming from the Caucasus, are barbarian peoples who have been trading with the Romans for centuries, but they're getting more and more aggressive on the northern Danube. 
frontier. So in the third century, the, the Romans are faced with a situation where there's a great deal to play for. They had expanded very aggressively into Parthian regions in the east, but they're now in a position where under Hadrian they had retrenched and they're... they're um, essentially in a situation where different generals across the empire are trying it out on the frontier and trying to build up a position as being the man who can bring Rome back together. Uh, so when the Persians take over, uh, the Sasanians take over from the Parthians in the 220s, uh, on, on, as it were, on the eastern frontier, it puts those buffer states, Syria, um, the independent city-states uh, such as Palmyra, which for years had been treated at essentially quite benevolently as free cities that were working for Rome, that were helping to mediate Roman trade into the east, into the Persian Gulf, the Euphrates, the Persian Gulf, and ultimately onto India, uh, and even as far as Madagascar for cinnamon. Uh, you know, there's this incredible trade of of hundreds of millions of sesterces, according to Pliny, that's going through these desert trading posts. And Palmyra, which had originally been a, a little city built around a spring in the middle of the desert between the Mediterranean and the Euphrates, uh, it, fi it finds itself under the stable Roman period in a really good position, as Edith has said. But then in the, in the mid-third century... You get a number of factors. You get, on the one hand, the Sasanians have got, they're much stronger than the Parthians were. They're on the rise. Uh, they're much more hostile to the independent buffer states around them. So, for example, they start to challenge Palmyra's right to levy taxes in the area, uh, which puts Palmyra essentially, you know, either on the back foot or the front foot. So they have to get aggressive with the Persians. And, and they, they negotiate, but they really, you can see them negotiating with an eye to expanding and becoming aggressive if they need to. Um, really, I think the reason that you get the emergence of an independent Palmyrene state, I would say, and I don't know if Edith agrees with me, that it's it's kind of a, a, a winner-take-all situation. You've got usurpers sprouting up all over the uh, all over the Mediterranean in this period, and in fact, uh, Zenobia's husband Odonathus uh, is that how you say it? Um, is uh, he is the person who actually takes control of the East from usurpers who have already kind of uh, uh, Roman generals who have taken this region in the two sixties. Yeah, but as I understand it, the Romans have, are not quite as preoccupied with uh, Palmyra in the middle of the third century as they are with the north and west, where the serious trouble and incursions going on there. So they moved their forces over there, as you slightly alluded to. Well, in the late second century, under Septimius Severus, there's a big push on the eastern frontier because they're aware of the Parthian mm. instability and they're trying to take advantage. But then in the early to mid sec third century, 200s, you get, because of these Gothic uh, invasions coming from the north, you essentially get a sort of pulling back of forces and kind of trying to to let the kind of let the Parthians lie. Of course, that feeds into the Sassanids taking taking advantage, at which point uh, Persia is really back on the radar. So just to sum up, yeah. at about that time, the Romans' attention is more uh, focused on the north and the west and hoping that the east will get on with itself without causing too much trouble. It, and that's about the time when, when Zenobia uh, makes her appearance. That, that's more... Well, uh, it's a little bit more complicated in that the Sasanians emerge from the 220s. By the 240s, they're causing enough trouble that, that, uh, that the... Palmyrians are having to get involved and the Roman generals are having to get involved. But around 260 is really the crisis point when the when the Sasanian king takes the Roman emperor Valerian captive. Um, and once that happens in 260, it's really all hell breaks loose. Well, before all hell breaks loose, um, yeah. Richard, Richard Selman, can you tell us a little bit more? We've got some information already about Palmyra and its history. Palmyra is a de desert oasis. Its importance is the fact that it lies halfway between the Mediterranean coast and the Euphrates River, which was for many centuries the border between the Roman Empire and the Parthian Empire, and subsequently the, the Persian Empire. It remained a pretty small 
place for a very long time. It appears in, in the Bible in, under the name of Tadmor. And then it... Uh, when you say a very long time, what do you mean? Uh, I mean from 600 BC, something like that. And then... Uh, <clears throat> I think the, spring, the settlement around the springs is there from, from rather earlier, isn't it? Well, when, well, whenever you like It's archaeologically like mentioned as early as the 18th century BC, BC and then yeah. Solomon fortifies it in the, in the 10th, 10th or 9th century. Yeah. Yes. OK. Um, so it, uh, it becomes of importance to us um, when it becomes part of the Roman Empire and it becomes a Roman frontier post in around... Uh, uh, probably in the reign of the Emperor Tiberius, uh, sometime soon after AD 14, um, at which point the city starts to acquire the magnificent array of monumental buildings that uh, characterises most of the Roman cities of the East and of North Africa. So you've got, uh, first of all, the Temple of the god Bel, which is built probably around AD 17 to 19. Very interesting building because it's entirely on a Near Eastern ground plan and subsequent uh, temples built in Palmyra are built on a classical model. So you're seeing this complete interplay of uh, Arab traditions, uh, um, Semitic traditions more generally, and uh, the Hellenic Roman tradition of, of architecture. Um, further building in the region, the Temple of Baal Shamin in the Lord of Heaven <clears throat> in the late 1st century AD, and then following that, some other temples, the massive colonnade, which uh, goes right down the, uh, the centre of the city of Palmyra and is uh, divided halfway along by what's called the Tetrapylon, the gateway that faces four ways and divides the two main streets of the city as they cross. And all these buildings are um, of a kind that you can meet in other cities of the Near East, such as Gerasa, uh, Jerash in uh, Jordan and Baalbek in, in Lebanon. Um, it was much admired and liked by the Romans, as I understand it, because mm. it, was, uh, it was very agreeable weather all the year round, and yet there was a good source of water. The water, of course, is very, very important mm. in, uh, in, a, in a desert climate. What numbers are we talking about in Pomara? Have any idea? Um, I, it's very difficult to talk mm. about population numbers in ancient cities, but most, mostly they are, they are small, and the physical uh, circumference of the city is not that great, and one may be thinking of a population of 10,000, really, really quite small. But um, that would, of course, also include the... Uh, or the city's territory, the Khura, would include all the outlying villages with... Uh, peasant population, uh, unquantifiable numbers of slaves, um, and the, uh, the Roman military presence. We, uh, we've talked, uh, Edith alluded to the wealth. This was because of a switch in the track of the silk trade, wasn't it? Uh, that's right. Um, the silk road, or the silk route, the silk and spice route it is, really, because, as Kate said, um, Pliny castigated the Romans of his period in the first century AD for their... Uh, addiction to uh, the spices in particular of the East and uh, to complained that, uh, that Rome spent 100,000 sesterces a year, whatever that means, on, uh, on this trade. Um, so the, uh, the, spice, the spices come by stages from, from the Far East, from the East Indies, from South India, from, uh, from uh, Ethiopia and South Arabia, where the, uh, where the balsam trees grow. And they at different periods, the, the route changes. Uh, for a long time, particularly during the first century AD, it uh, ran up the, uh, up the Red Sea um, to uh, Elat, Ilana, ancient Ro Roman Ilana, and then up through, uh, through Nabatea to, uh, to the Mediterranean coast. But there was also an alternative route which could come in through the, uh, the Persian Gulf, up the Euphrates, and then across the desert via Palmyra, uh, again to, to Damascus and the Mediterranean coast. And this was how, uh, uh, how Palmyra came to prominence, both as, uh, as being involved in the trade, because we shouldn't ever think of the Silk Road uh, or Silk Route as being something that is... Uh, monolithic, I and mean, people like Marco Polo, who go from one end of the uh, the trading line to the other, are very, very exceptional. Though we do hear of a character called Can Ying in antiquity, but um, uh, it's done by stages, and the 
Palmyrene's function was to carry the spices and silks over um, a certain stage and also to protect the caravans. There are a number of uh, honorific inscriptions from Palmyra to uh, honouring synodiarchs, protectors of the caravans. OK, so Edithal, we have a place that's very rich uh, and it's it's been given great powers by Rome to get on with its own business. Uh, it has had good... It has now, when we're talking about it, now, just before Zenobia's time, it has had a, a good ruler and so it's used to a measure of independence and used to a great measure of wealth. Uh, what's known about Zenobia's character before she, uh, as, as she comes on the scene? Well, she's the second wife of um, Odinathus, who's, the, who's this very, very able governor. She's probably a bit younger than, than his first wife, who also has a son and, 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 and is a rival. She's she still alive? I mean, this is... A um, th- the other woman is one of the big mysteries. We don't have a name. We know very little about her. We know right. that there is a rival son who's older, called Hiran, for, um, and Zenobia has had a little boy called Vabalathus, is his um, name. They have sort of strange Syriac names which are transliterated into, into Latin and Greek. They, they, they sound strange in Latin and Greek. Um, her own name was, in fact, um, Beth Zabar um, in, in her own Aramaic language, and she's known today um, in the Arab world as al Zabai. Um, her, that is transformed into the much more recognisable sounding Greek sounding Zenobia. Do you see what I mean? She probably called herself uh, Beth Shabar. She's certainly brought up extremely educated. She, um, her family claimed to be connected with the uh, amazing family from Emesa, which is we know as Homs, who had married in to the uh, Roman imperial family. She, she's a distant relative of an empress called Julia. Domna, who'd married Septimius Severus and had actually gone and been Empress of Rome. Highly powerful intellectual culture in Syria. Some of the greatest philosophers um, of, of, of late antiquity were actually Syrians. Um, and we know that certainly once she actually became um, the sort of dowager uh, queen after Adinathus's murder in 267... We know that she, um, uh, after that, that she had four or five of the most distinguished intellectuals in the entire Roman Empire. I don't want to be dowager yet. We've got, um, Sorry. We haven't quite got there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we have a young, yeah. it is said, unbelievably beautiful, yeah, yeah, unbelievably yeah. athletic. <sighs> OK. Yeah. okay. All right, all right. I'm worried about these sources. You, you've read all the sources several times. Yeah, fine. Right. I have read the sources. Why shouldn't she, 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 no, no, she be reason. young and beautiful? She Indeed. gets to marry the governor of Syria. I think exactly. it's highly likely that she was. And she's fertile. She produces a son. Uh, she can ride brilliantly, but I think an awful lot of these these women could. Uh, you know, this is where Gibbon got it all wrong. She was not an exception to the secluded women of ancient Arabia. I think that they tended to go into battle with their horses. Julia Domna, this great, 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 great aunt figure, had actually been called mother of the camp by her husband because she used to go and camp, not follow, but be mother of the camp. So these are astonishingly independent women. They are nothing like our, um, our, our, our image of, of, of secluded Athenian women, for example, who, who can't go out without a veil. They ride horses. She was said to be able to walk up to five miles at the front line of her troops. We don't know anything about it before then. I wish I could tell you. No, we, she no, only no comes you're telling to, us enough. You're telling us she enough. only I'm... comes to historical <laughs> life in 267. She fancies herself as well, We get as an to 267 quite soon. She I, I just want to ask Kate Cooper once a little more about Odonathus, the, her, the husband, and just give us a little more about him, and then okay. we're set to go. OK, um, it, one of the things that's really hard about Odonathus is he, he's local. He's from a Syrian family, but he's a Roman citizen from a family that are citizens before the great extension of citizenship in the in the third century under Caracalla. So he's from a family that have been in bed with Rome for a very long time. And it, there's a real question, to what extent does he think of himself as a Roman senator whose family comes from Syria versus to what extent does he think of himself as a local boy made good? I would tend to favour the former hypothesis. And so in, in that sense, he's, his military valour, which is enormous, everything we know about Odonithus suggests that he always thought of himself as acting on behalf of Rome. Even when he goes out and, uh, and reconquers uh, Asia Minor uh, from the so usurpers mili- who are there. He's, he is a military uh, uh, conqueror himself, isn't he? So let's get just to simply yes, get that exactly. straight. He he's... sails out of Amara, goes 500 kilometres into the former Persian Empire and 
does the business. He's one of the last great Roman senator generals who's got that elite family background, but also the incredible military prowess. Hey, did you want to come in there? Yes, I, I would agree. I, I think that these people actually rather despise a lot of the um, uh, upstart soldiers of the rest of the Roman Empire who tended to come from, from what's now Hungary or from North Africa and were not very educated, didn't speak Greek, were extremely uncouth. And, and so weirdly, I think also people often don't realise how multicultural the actual Roman administration was at this period. You know, you had had an African emperor with a Syrian wife very recently, uh, more recently than the Severans. You then have had this chain, as Edith says, of uncouth barbarian generals or, or not necessarily barbarian, but provincial generals. Uh, and so in a sense, somebody who's from an old urban family in, in many ways, is, is the exemplification of what made Rome great. Richard Stanham, can you tell us how Zenobia rose to power? She came to power as a result of the murder of her husband, Odonathus. We Did she have any hand in that herself? Um, it has, of course, been suggested, but there is no evidence one way or the other. Um, what, uh, what we are told is that there was some kind of a quarrel over hunting and he was uh, murdered by... Um, uh, an enemy. What seems quite likely is that he has risen to power from among the rival sheikh families of uh, of Palmyra, and there is a rival who has had enough of his uh, his prominence and puts him out of the way. But the result of this is not that that rival comes to the throne, but that uh, his son comes to the throne. His son, uh, Vabalathus, is still a minor. He, if if they were married in about. Um, to um, to sixty of two sixty or so. I mean, she, he can't be more than about ten. We're to talking about Zenobia's son. We're talking about Zenobia's son. Yeah, but Vabalathus. actually, there's, there's another son. That, that, and this is what the makes one suspicious. Son. Yeah, yes. because um, he his son was murdered mm. at the same time, clearing the way for Zenobia's yes. son. Yes. So, do you know anything about the, the murder of his son? Um, I think there's almost nothing we're told us except that he was murdered. Um, With his father. Yes. So the two of them are got out of the way at the same time. So it does look suspicious, doesn't it? Yes. But there is no, uh, <laughs> there is no uh, evidence because the sources are, are so, uh, so slight, really. So, so Zenobia's small, uh, young, very young son becomes the heir and she becomes the regent and assumes full power right away. That's right. In, uh, already in 266-7, after the murder of Odinathus, uh, Vabalathus is starting to appear on coins. Uh, so or the new emperor, um, or the, the Roman emperor, is appearing on the obverse and Vabalathus appears on the reverse. But pretty soon after that, he's appearing on the obverse of the coins himself um, uh, or with the title Imperator and then you get coins of Zenobia also um, with, the, with the same title so she is coming to Zenobia prominence Augusta. Oh, not, Zenobia Augusta not, thank not, you that's not till quite a lot later though I mean she, she holds off on that for well, four or five 270, years isn't it? 272 272 right at the end yes yeah. And, and it seems that she's already been challenged by Aurelian at that point, really. That, that well, Aurelian's the Roman yeah. general. We, yeah. We're coming to we'll him in a down. moment or two. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. kind of, uh, it's, it's one step at a time, really, for me, anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, so she's in power. She's, she's a regent. That is acceptable, Edith, this woman in power? Um, is she having to fight that corner before she does anything else? I'm sure she had to fight the corner, mm. but actually um, she's a descendant of, 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 the, of the Ptolemies as well as, as, as the Seleucids, the same family as, as Cleopatra. Um, and it, for hundreds of years, these old Macedonian families had a rather brutal Darwinian system where you would have several wives with children and, and actually the wives fought it out between them and did indeed kill off <laughs> right children and each other um, in order for, for, for to get their sons on the throne, however, however um, young they might be. So it was actually a, an extremely normal um, system. I think she did have a right-hand man in her general who she inherited from her husband. Uh, yes, he's called Zabdas, sometimes Labdas, Zaba. Um, and he stuck with her throughout and was a, himself a brilliant general. So she's got this part. Does she immediately seize it and, and, as it were, subtext, I'm in charge now, this is what I'm going to do? If so, what does she go to do? Can I come in on that? Yes. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the sources are, are not 
are not precise on this point, but what they make clear is that by securing her husband's general, she she is perceived very quickly by the Palmyrene military as being the authentic representative of their of their group. Yeah. And what she's playing for is trying to be like her husband, the the accepted and authoritative representative of Rome. But that's where things go wrong. Now it's possible that it's because uh, Aurelian has something against her individually, but it's it's more likely that it's simply that under Gallienus at the time of her husband's death. Rome actually needed somebody in the region. And it's not until later that a, a, that a, an empire from the West is in a position to come East himself. But in, uh, it's, as, as I was alluded to earlier in the conversation, around 260, the Romans started to lose their grip. And that, did she see this as a chance? I'd just, just like to, to know what your view is mm. about, did she set out to create an empire mm. or did she set out to push a bit and found, oh, I can go that far, I'll go a little bit further. Did she have a, uh, did she have a longer policy or was it, was it as it came? Well, I think you'll get three different opinions out of us. <laughs> My opinion is that I mean, the degree of incompetence in the Western Roman Empire at this time. There had been 19 emperors since 235, almost all of which... That's in about 30 years. Yeah, Yeah. had been murdered by their own Praetorian Guard or by their own generals. And the empire was falling to bits. 19? Yes! And Britain Britain and Gaul had actually split off for the first time in in, ever. They had lost... You know, the whole of that part of of, of the empire, uh, the Hungarians, the Pannonians and the Scythians and the Goths were all kicking off. It was just chaos. I think that she thought that she was the ruler of her people and that they would have a much more peaceful and a better time. If she went to war. If she, no, <laughs> if she consolidated, she never tried to get beyond the Dardanelles. <coughs> she went up to the Bosporus and she took Egypt. So she got a very sensible geopolitical arc yeah, of an Eastern Empire. She never tried to take the West and she was much loved and respected by a lot of people in Egypt. We know that Timagenes was the, was the, was the, uh, her, her friend there who actually helped her, her take it. There is absolutely an argument that she was really quite an altruistic, principled leader of, of Syria. There is absolutely no uh, suggestion, for, 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 for um, example, that she was anything other than, than a fair and, and, and systematic user of punishment. She beheaded people when the men beheaded them, but not when they didn't. I mean, she, she was a very good leader. The, yes, Gibbon goes on and on about her uh, uh, temperance in that area and so on. About her. Yes, he, well, I'm a, a, I, I think it's almost a fantasy rather than a history. Of that. But that's another. <laughs> that's another. That's another. Sorry, that's another program. I want to a, correct Richard. the fantasy of her being this sort of sexual person who went around in chains and and and, and we're not things, there yet. The other one. <laughs> that's at the end of the program. I want Slay the down. other fantasy. <laughs> uh, if we're just, we've only got alternative fantasies. Can I just advocate the good, sensible yeah. ruler? But I'm, I'm with a good sensible role. I'm, I'm just asking you about it. I'm going to Richard Stoneman now because I want to know. Again, you, in your view, because there seem to be slightly differing views here, why do you think? Did she decide to rebel against the Roman Empire? Was that what she was trying to do? Or was she trying to. You tell me. There are, many, there are a number of different ways of interpreting what, uh, what Zenobia did. Um, the Historia Augusta which, as we know, is more or less a fantastical, fictional piece of work from the late 4th century, has her writing a letter to the Emperor Aurelian shortly before the conquest, saying, it was my idea that we might become partners in empire. So it was not an impossible idea that a Syrian queen should become a a ruler of the Roman Empire. Edith has mentioned Julia Domna, and there was the whole Syrian dynasty about uh, 50, 60 years before this. Um, But there are other ways of looking at it as well. It doesn't have to be a union of empires. It could have been a breakaway state. Uh, There are lots of good reasons for supposing that the lack of security that the Roman legions were able to provide on the frontiers was becoming a real problem for for the the trade of Palmyra and that the only way to protect it uh, was to to establish uh, an independent state That doesn't entirely explain why she might have invaded Egypt, because to invade Egypt is to strike directly at Rome, not at its heart, but at its stomach, because that was where the grain came from to give the Roman plebs their bread and circuses, the bread half of their circuses. So why did she go to Egypt, Edith Hall? I mean, that was, as as Richard said, that Rome, one of the things Roman citizens were promised was free bread, Mm. and the bread came from the grain, came from Egypt. Mm. 
Well, I think that the the the, the argument that she was very um, worried about about the Roman ability to pr- protect all the important trade routes is, is a very valid one. Egypt, however, she probably had a sentimental attachment to it, it's true. She claimed that she was descended from Cleopatra the Seventh, and her, she had a historian um, called Callinicus who wrote almost immediately after she'd taken Egypt a ten-volume history of Egypt, which she addressed to my Cleopatra. Um, and, and we know so, about court histories, though, don't we? Uh, yes, we, we, we do in, indeed. But, again, the fact is that there were... The, terrible problem of piracy going on. The Romans were spending all their time in the Mediterranean worried about pirates off, off Libya. Um, they, 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 weren't, they had their eye off the ball. Yes, she was an opportunist, but it was, I think it was a combination of pragmatic necessity and um, uh, self-protectiveness. And yes, in the case of Egypt, I think she wanted to get back the old Syrian-Egyptian um, historic association between sort of Seleucids she and Ptolemies. She wanted to be the new Cleopatra, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Kate, Co- Kate Cooper, can, how big was her empire? She, it was, in fact, we're talking about two or three years here, aren't we? How, how big was it at its greatest extent? It, given how, how, uh, how short its duration was, it's amazing how large it was. It goes basically from, um, from, the, from the Nile uh, up through Egypt, uh, all the way around what's now the Sinai Peninsula, ancient Arabia, up through uh, Syria, what's now Lebanon, the Holy Land, and then up into, um, into Turkey. Turkey, as far as the Black Sea, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if she held the Black Sea, but she, there was certainly, uh, and, and then Ankara. all the way west to Ankara. Uh, so the so there's a real sense of probably, uh, you know, the whole eastern end of the Mediterranean, uh, kind of halfway halfway Turkey, all the way to all, all the way over to the Euphrates. But what does conquering mean at this stage? Does it mean she left garrisons there to hold the territory? Does it mean she marched into the places with an effective army and they caved? and said, we'll come back in a year or two's time. What does the conquering actually mean? It's a really important question, and I think possibly one where you'll get different answers. My answer is that it's about loyalty. We know that she had um, that she had be, been cultivating relationships with uh, with generals and merchants uh, all over this region. We also know, and I think those those um, caravan protectors that Richard was talking about before actually are potentially quite important. One of the things about Palmyra that was so important was it was seen as a place that could uh, where you could organize protection in the desert for a large and immense immensely valuable caravan. So there's an idea of these incredibly um, agile horsemen that are that are able to command large kind of private armies. Um, and if you think about a network of merchants all around the eastern Mediterranean, Alexandria, Antioch, uh, and then up into uh, Asia Minor, modern Turkey, uh, if you think about a, a, a network of merchants who are looking for protection for the transport of their wares, I think you'll find that there was a lot of cooperation. And then we have an, <coughs> a new emperor. <coughs> Excuse me. It's partly Zenobia's bad fortune, doesn't it? After these 19 men in, in, in <laughs> about 30 years scrapping all over the place and losing bits of Britain and Gaul, we have a, a, a tough guy turns up, really. Sorry about this. Sorry to be uh, in Hollywood at the moment. <laughs> I, I, but I, I exercise that. Right. Yeah, a tough, efficient emperor who deals with stuff in the West and then turns his... his, turns his weapons on her, Aurelian. Uh, Can you tell us something about him and why he was so effective? Um, Aurelian really turned the Roman Empire around in the in the 270s. He became emperor in 271. As I think has been said, he originated from the Danubian provinces, as so many of these tough military leaders who became emperor did. Uh, he didn't last for very long. It was only four or five years, but he really, really made a big difference. And he had not only the uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. The Gallic revolt to put down, but much more importantly, the the revolt of Zenobia. Now, when he set out, he to, did other things as well. Though. He tackled inflation. He built a wall around well, Rome. That's, that really comes. That it, really comes it? after yeah. the uh, after the uh, reduction of Palmyra, because he gains strength and stability from from that. And as you say, he uh, he uh, reforms the coinage, um, suppresses the. Uh, um, some mysterious revolt among the moneyers in Rome, and he built the the Aurelian walls, as they are still called, and as they still stand around most of the centre of Rome. He did do that 
before he went yeah. to Palmyra. That's really yeah. important because he, he made sure that his back door had, was shut before he went east. So did he? Okay. He just t- he took certain forces there and took her on. Now there was, as I understand, at least two b- battles of some significance. Three, but the last one. Anyway, two, let's. You have three, Edith. We'll start with number one. What happened in the first battle? Okay. Um, the <clears throat> the first battle uh, took took place at at Antioch, and this is the this is the uh, the really major battle when the uh, when the two and is Zenobia present at this battle? Zen- Zenobia is is present. Mm-hmm. Yes, and uh, it's a battle between uh, two or or three Roman legions, which have the uh, reputation of having gone very soft in the preceding centuries because they've been enjoying themselves in the luxurious warm climate of the east and not having too much to do. But Aurelian doesn't have any of that, and he toughens them up very fast and. Uh, um, brings into play all the uh, all the formidable skills of a of a Roman fighting force, which is very different from the forces that would have uh, faced him on the other side. The uh, the Palmyrene army, like uh, like Arab uh, or like the Persian army, rather um, relied very much on heavily armoured cavalry, um, horse archers, and very fast camel riders. Uh, the uh, the Heavily armoured troops, uh, whom both the Persians and the Palmyrenes deployed, were known by the Romans as clibanarii, which means oven men. So the uh, the iron helmets and breastplates and so on that they wore were like ovens so this in the desert Antioch, heat. Sorry to rush yes. This battle of Antioch, was it a close fought battle? Did you lose by an inch or by a mile? Uh, what do you say, Edith? Um, Mile. A mile. mile, yes, yes. But that... Isn't that the one where the armour was, was really important because Aurelian, he, he keeps stalling as That's the right. sun gets higher and higher That's right. so, so that, the, so so that, that the, they're uh, cooked in their armour. So that the Palmarine soldiers can toast nicely and they will exactly. be uh, much easier to put for the, uh, for the light. So that's the Battle of Antioch. Mm. She is defeated. What yeah. happens next, Edith? Well, then it moves south. Uh, she, she basically gets away to, to Emesa, Homs, which is um, southeast, and uh, there's another battle outside the walls of, of Emesa. There is conflicting... Uh, evidence in in the sources, but basically that is what happened. Again, it's the cavalry. Uh, the the Romans are very clever and managed to get the cavalry to turn on itself and tramp, trample it itself. There's some kind of problem with uh, that. The, the, it's supposed to be seventy thousand strong. This this um, uh, Palmyrene um, cavalry um, and the uh, Palestinian slingers seem to have been particularly <laughs> effective in this. Okay, uh, they, 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 their slings really got these guys on their horses and their, uh, and, and their horses. That is what the, the sources do all say. She managed to escape from Emissa on a camel. Um, and 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 got to Palmyra, oh, no. and, and then there is or is not, <laughs> depending on which source you, a big violent siege. But she's beaten. We don't know how bad the siege was before they surrendered. Some people say it went on for months and they were starved out. Um, others say actually no, that it capitulated quite quickly. And she is one, either she flees and is captured before she gets to the Euphrates, or anyway she's captured. What she's happens captured, after yeah. she is captured? Um, Cooper. Well, she's brought, brought back to Rome in, in chains. That Again, of course, the sources vary. Some sources say that she dies crossing, I think, the Bosphorus on the way. Uh, but at least two sources talk about her arriving in Rome. One talks about her arriving in Rome in a golden chariot that she had originally in, uh, commissioned in order to ride in triumph into Rome. Uh, the, uh, the Historia Augusta, our main source, talks about her arriving bound in golden chains uh, which are are really, I think, partly just an expression of her wealth and kind of bigging up the triumph of Aurelian capturing this woman. There are alternative readings about the end. Do you hold to that one, Richard Sturman, or do you have another one? Well, the alternative uh, story is that uh, she reached Rome safely. She managed to avoid being... Uh, uh, executed on the Capitol in the way that uh, captured uh, prisoners normally were, and instead was allowed to retire gracefully to a villa at Tivoli. Uh, I don't think. Well, from uh, you're the historian, but I think that, I think Aurelian was too tough to let anybody retire if he'd beaten them. <laughs> but that, that's my that's an amateur. Right. But Edith, there's a third possibility, isn't there? Well, well, there's, well, there's, well, there's four. Uh, <laughs> but um, she, yes, she she was either. Um, 
led in a triumph in Rome and executed. She was led in triumph in Rome and then allowed to, to get hold in a villa <laughs> on the Tivoli. Or she died um, in some kind of illness uh, near the Bosporus. Or she committed suicide, and I am absolutely sure that she committed suicide rather than be displayed at Rome. Cleopatra had committed suicide. Mithridates, the great rebel against Rome, had committed suicide rather than be displayed at, at Rome. I do not believe she was going to give Aurelian that pleasure. I'm sure he had the triumph in 274, which is the probably most impressive Roman triumph ever held. I mean, we are talking um, 800 gladiators, the entire populus Romanus, um, the entire Roman um, military, and an awful lot of captives from every barbarian tribe he had reduced, but I don't think she was there. Can you... uh, And this was a turning point in the fortunes of Rome for that time. Can you just, though, moving rather more quickly than that, uh, what about Palmyra? He went... He just... You tell me what Aurelian did to Palmyra, Edith. Well, I'm uh, sorry that, that yet again there are conflicting versions. Um, some sources say he was um, absolutely uh, barbaric in, in his reduction of, of Palmyra and that it was virtually wiped out. Um, others say that al- although it lost a lot of its wealth, in fact there was a little rebellion. Maybe, in fact, Zenobia's own father is sometimes alleged to have, have become governor of Palmyra. It certainly lost its massive privileged status and, and its wealth, but it didn't die out at that point in antiquity. And the legacy, very briefly, Kate. I think one of the really interesting things about Zenobia is if you think about her by comparison to Cleopatra, why doesn't she get the same afterlife? I'm she does to... She does in the Middle Ages, but she doesn't... Well, there's Chaucer in the Middle yeah, Ages. Yeah, Chaucer, exactly. Yeah. His Monk's Tale talks about her. Uh, but I think the big problem is that Shakespeare doesn't pick up on her. I was going to say that. <laughs> You pinch my Five very good years was a lot longer than most of those Roman emperors survived. You're defending her to the first of the last thing, but she didn't. Yeah. Trouble is, Shakespeare didn't write about her, <laughs> and he did write about Cleopatra. Well, that's not the trouble, that's a flip ending for a very good discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Next week, thank you very much to Edith Hall, Kate Cooper, and Richard Stoneman. And next week, we'll be talking about Einstein's two theories of relativity. Thank you. There are many more Radio 4 arts and discussion programmes to download for free. Find these on the website at bbc.co.uk slash radio4.